Thank you for coming. Uh, good morning to you, ladies and gentlemen. And my special thanks to uh, Graham Rand for his magnificent uh, organization of this conference and for having the faith needed to persuade an 87-year-old to give a plenary address. <laughs> 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 These reflections uh, will be in written form as well, but not, that's not quite finished yet. Uh, they cover the many years that I have spent uh, in, with a professional life trying to make sense of the everyday world which unfolds through time in order to bring about positive change in that, in real world situations uh, which are considered to be problematical, and that's what got me onto uh, soft systems uh, methodology. So the back, my background is that uh, <clears throat> when I left school, I went to uh, Oxford and read chemistry, and uh, they gave me a first, which was nice of them, uh, but it never led to my working in chemistry ever for a single day in my life. Uh, no, I, I wanted to do something in real life, and I left the university uh, after the, the four-year course in chemistry and went into what was then Britain's biggest manufacturing company, uh, ICI, and I was there for 14 years, 14 enthralling years, uh, leading research groups, and uh, when I left ICI, there were I was the manager of a 100-strong group of researchers, and our job then was to uh, look at the new polymers that had emerged, nylon, polyester, polypropylene, and work out new products and processes using these new materials. Uh, I left after 14 years and joined Lancaster University as a professor of systems in a postgraduate uh, department and this is, this is what gave me the opportunity to do what I then have spent so much time doing which is developing soft systems methodology uh, all of which I have uh, greatly enjoyed. Uh, in thinking about the experience as a whole uh, I can't help keep thinking reminding myself that this is my last day as an academic after today, I am a retired academic. And looking at the, the material that I could put into a plenary address, uh, I, what I thought I should do is focus on a couple of ideas, two contrasting modes of thought, which are very relevant uh, to developing things in real life uh, situations. And th the... Uh, the, the, the ideas I will come to in a moment, but first I must thank in the first slide, because <clears throat> this is a rock climber from Yorkshire. And the reason that he is there is that once I had given the title of my talk, I kept being approached by people who said, what's a Parthian shot? And this is an example in real life of a Parthian shop. In the real world, the Parthians were in the country that is now Persia, and they were horsemen, and they used to uh, ride about uh, in Persia and looking for their enemies. And when they found their enemies, very interesting this, they would turn tail and gallop away from their enemies, but they would then slow up knowing that the enemies would say, look, lads, they're on the run, let's chase them. And they would then chase the Parthians, and they would, the Parthians would slow up, let the enemies get very close, and then do their trick, which is to get their bows and arrows out, turn round in the saddle, and fire their arrows into the uh, enemy who were just behind them. Uh, and uh, that was the original Parthian shot. 
Nowadays, a Parthian shot is regarded as something which happens at a moment of change between different activities. And since this is my last day as an operating academic, I could today uh, do a Parthian shot, which would uh, probably get me into trouble. So uh, uh, I have said in my title, this is a friendly Parthian shot. What happens uh, in a Parthian shot, as I say, is it, it's at a moment of junction between one kind of activity uh, and, and, and another. And this is, this is a photograph of this magnificent rock climber, uh, John Dunn. I'm a rock climber myself, but a very modest, uh, modest, mod modest ability. But I've been a rock climber for 60 years. Uh, he came from Yorkshire to one of the crags in Derbyshire and put up a new route, which was immediately the hardest route in Derbyshire. And imagine the chagrin of the local Derbyshire climbers that the hardest climb in their crags was done by someone, of all things, from Yorkshire. <laughs> and the next slide is an, a, a Derbyshire climber. And this is just to int introduce the idea of how incredibly difficult this particular climb was. Uh, because uh, this is a guy called Neil Bentley in the second picture, and he is just getting to the top of this climb. And I can't imagine how either John there or Neil there managed to stay in contact with the, with the rock. And uh, it's a Parthian shot because John Dunn chose the name of the climb to be a Parthian shot. So, I'll now get down to the real talk. Uh, I was born in 1930, and uh, with Hitler in power in Germany, uh, the whole country seemed to know a, a phrase associated with the then Prime Minister, uh, Baldwin. He said, the bomber will always get through. And I have a vague memory, I think it's right, it's a genuine memory of my asking my parents at the time, that the Sunday morning when uh, the, the, everybody thought a war would be coming. And, and I was asked my parents, uh, what does that mean, the bomber will always get through? And uh, I can't remember how they persuaded me to... Uh, somehow absorb that thought. Uh, in 1887, a German scientist, Hertz, uh, discovered that radio waves, if directed against a solid object, especially a metal one, uh, they will be reflected just as beams of light are. And uh, at that time, this was a new technology available. And the a leading German scientist who was in charge of their signals directed a beam of uh, radio waves across Kiel Harbour, where there was a battleship uh, uh, in, in, this, in the waiting there. And this was reflected back and gave him a picture of the shape of that battleship. So that this, this, to this technology was known both to the Allies and to the Germans. Uh, before the Second World War uh, broke out. So radar had come, though it, the word comes from the Americans. It was the Americans who made up the word uh, radar. The Germans were technically more advanced than the British. They captured a, a British portable radar set and uh, poo-pooed it. It was nothing like as sophisticated as, the, as, as their own... Uh, and uh, uh, technology, and, and this continued uh, to, to be the case. So in the, in the 1930s, in the summers of those years, uh, the British set to, set to work to use this new technology, and they built a set of radar, 
re receivers starting in the Tyne in northeast England, all the way down the east coast, all the way along the south coast as far as uh, Southampton. And this meant that they then, in those, uh, the, the, uh, the, in, in the, uh, the, the 1930s uh, half days, so to speak, in the good weather, they plotted out how to use that, uh, that technology. And uh, the, the, the working of it, by, by the time that the war broke out, the information system about planes heading for the UK were well prepared. And uh, the, it, it, uh, it worked. And it was a unique information system. And it brought together a team of RAF officers, fighter pilots, and post office engineers who kept this information system uh, in, in, in action during the uh, Battle of Britain. Uh, the working of the unique system saved the country from uh, invasion. It impressed the enemy as well as the British themselves. Adolf Galland was a German Messerschmitt pilot who was the, the best pilot that the Germans had got, and he shot down more hurricanes and spitfires than any other German pilot. And uh, he then wrote a book about his own experience of the Battle of Britain. And this is what he said concerning uh, the radar system. Its success was outstanding. This is the German book in translation. Our planes were already detected over the Pas de Calais while they were assembling and they were never allowed to escape the radar eye. British Fighter Command was able to direct its forces to the most favourable position at the most propitious time. Uh, so, at the time of the Battle of Britain, and in, that, in this context, uh, the, the o pro OR project that created that information system uh, was underway. And uh, it seems to me that uh, what was done in those summers of 1930s is probably still the best piece of OR ever carried out, certainly in terms of impact. Uh, because of it, uh, Goering, had, uh, Goering had told Hitler that he needed four days to destroy the RAF. But many months later, the RAF were still flying their hurricanes and spitfires. And uh, this uh, led Hitler to abandon Operation Sea Lion, which was the German name for the invasion of this country. And instead, he made the crucial error of launching his attack on Russia. And uh, that, of course, ultimately led to his downfall. I mean, we in the UK can count ourselves lucky that Hitler imagined himself to be a masterly military planner. And I, I, the best chapter that I've written in any of my books, I'm not sure which, which one, just uh, on the spur of the moment, but is, is an account of the creation in a, through OR of the Battle of Britain information system. And I'm glad to be able to, uh, to talk about that. Obviously, the new technology would be uh, considered by many people and might be expected to go in, in many directions. Uh, and <clears throat> this didn't happen immediately, but in 1963, a book was published following the wartime experience, uh, which was... Uh, put together by Pat Rivette and Russ Acoff, well known in, these, uh, in, in this world, uh, called Operational Research for Managers, describing what it, the new technology could do for, uh, uh, for managers in industry. There were two in this book, which is uh, a now forgotten book, it's a rather short book, now rather forgotten, 
But uh, two themes were powerful in it. Uh, the desirability of doing OR with a multidisciplinary team, and they suggested in the book that uh, to do OR, you need such a team, and they suggested the team should include a physical scientist, an engineer, a mathematician, statistician, a biologist, a mathematical economist, a behavioural scientist, and a cost analyst. And I don't imagine any piece of OR OR has ever been done which precisely collected together that group, of, uh, that group of people. The second big thought that came with that technology uh, was that there are problem types in the real world which recur. And they also had a list of uh, seven t problem types uh, which they suggest should have attention. Inventory issues, allocation, queuing, sequencing, routing, competition, and search. And the, these, uh, these, this, these were the, the seven items needed in the other group of uh, multidisciplinary people uh, undertaking OR. And I don't imagine that... Uh, well, yes, there are plenty of OR techniques, but I don't imagine that that particular collection has ever been assembled again either. So, that, that was uh, a, a very famous piece of work in, in launching uh, OR. And uh, what I'm going to do in the, in the talk is to refer to two ideas which have been tight with me over the whole of the time I've spent at Lancaster developing soft systems methodology, thinking holistically and going to uh, reductionism. These are two ideas which I've been uh, trying to use, playing with for the whole of my uh, technical, uh, technical career. And uh, the what I'm going to do in the talk is to fill in this gap between the holism and the reductionism. So the first slide is on the screen. This was the wartime work of establishing the Battle of Britain information system. This is then the second body of knowledge which I want to, uh, to there are five altogether. This, this was the work of uh, uh, Rivet at Lancaster and, and uh, Ross Acoff of putting together, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, in, in, uh, at Lancaster, the first OR department in a British university. Uh, and... Uh, That was quickly followed, and we really are going downhill. When I, when I prepared this talk and this slide, I thought it was appropriate, really, that one, two, three is going downhill, uh, because, uh, because what, what number three is... Uh, ..is a retreat to reductionism, that... After, after the work that was done, uh, oh, sorry, <laughs> keep me on track. Uh, what happened was in in OR, which I think was uh, unhappy, uh, was that it it became for many people not a collection of techniques, but uh, choices were made to be, I will be an expert on queuing theory, I will look at the depot location problem, and so on. And uh, this, 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 I thought, uh, this I thought was regrettable, but that, that, is, it, that is in fact uh, uh, what, what happened. And... Uh, <coughs> 
uni university textbooks began to arrive in which each chapter was one, one of the OR techniques and the holism of OR seemed to be, uh, seemed to be forgotten. It was, OR for many people was the name of the bag in which the separate isolated techniques all uh, had their home and university textbooks uh, emphasised that. That was a pity, I think. However, the world, the world moves on. And Jonathan Rosenhead, good friend of mine, uh, head of the OR group in the uh, London School of Economics, uh, he... Uh, he invented the, the notion PSM, which he, uh, for him, meant problem structuring methods. This is a holistic thought. But this is we're going back up towards holism again here. Uh, this this is uh, this this is very interesting because when he was seventy at LSE, uh, they had a birthday party one afternoon for him, and I was invited to go to that, and I'm, uh, I've got a lot of time for Jonathan Rosenhead, uh, who's been the president of this society uh, in the past. And uh, I was uh, at that birthday party, uh, I, I was able to say to uh, Jonathan that uh, there are only three things wrong with PSMs, the P, the S, and the Ms. <laughs> Uh, the P is for problems, and in the real world, problems are never static. They are always changing. Whatever the state of your problem is now, by next Thursday afternoon, it will have changed. And uh, S meant structuring, so PSMs for him meant problem structuring. And structuring is only a halfway approach. What you actually want to do, what you're trying to do there all the time, is to make changes, to make things happen, to improve things. Uh, so the, the, the P and the S are both uh, unfortunate in that sense. And the M, of course, is method. Uh, and of course, a method is something which is guaranteed to work every time, such as uh, the way in which you can solve any pair of uh, uh, e equations uh, using a, a, a well-known method and anybody can, uh, can learn it. Uh, what they really need there is methodology, the principles of method which then make a holistic whole again. So that was, that was uh, where the PSMs uh, got us to. The best thing to be said about a PSM, I think, ignoring, ignoring the inadequacy of the name, uh, is that we are back to a set of ideas which are rich enough together to convey stories. And readers of technical books love stories as well as, uh, as, well as fiction. And also, PSMs more recently have allowed the phrase soft OR to creep into our vocabulary. And uh, that, I think, indicates a welcome reluctance or refusal to surrender to reductionism. So that is, that is encouraging. And on the diagram, we are on the way back up, away from reductionism towards holism again. The last of the five uh, bodies of work which I have been uh, uh, res wrestling with for all these years uh, comes from uh, a man called uh, Jeffrey Vickers. Uh, a lawyer by profession, uh, 
I heard him give a talk and was so impressed by it, but I immediately thought I must get to know this man. And we, I got to know him and we invited him to be a visiting professor in the department at Lancaster. And he was 84 at the time, though he was more intellectually active at 84 than most people are at any point in their lives. And I've, uh, I've never had contact with a finer mind than that of Sir Geoffrey Vickers. On the day after his 21st uh, birthday in the First World War, at the Hohenzollern Redoubt in the Battle of Lewes, uh, Sir Geoffrey won the Victoria Cross, which is the highest award for gallantry in the British, in the British Army. And uh, I, he, I worked with him uh, a lot in, in the later development of uh, SSM, soft systems methodology. Vickers said that he found systems ideas very helpful in creating an epistemology uh, which would make sense of his main concern. The real question that was in his head all the time was, what is the nature of the social process? The happenings in the world which unfold through time uh, as real life is lived in the human world, in the flux of ever-changing happenings and ideas which mutually affect each other. Uh, he, he, uh, his prose in his writing, educated people think, is magnificent prose. People who aren't so well educated find it very difficult. And towards the end of his life, the Open University commissioned him to write a, another book. It was his, his last book, as it happens. And he wrote a book called Human Systems Are Different. And the Open University then used it with groups of students at weekends to get them to appraise this book. And they couldn't read it. it, it was, it's too elaborate. Uh, the, the independent and dependent clauses unfold and you have to keep things in your head as you wait for the next move. And this was too much for undergraduate, uh, undergraduate students. Uh, the density, the, the density of the thinking in the book turned out to be uh, too difficult uh, for uh, undergraduates uh, reading for open university uh, degrees. I suggested to Geoffrey that uh, systems, which are always a set of relationships in the real world, uh, are best represented in diagrams. But he said that for him, written prose was the medium of communication, and he left it, uh, he left it to that. He claimed to be unable to read diagrams. I, I felt the need to capture diagrammatically the concept of what Vickers calls an appreciative system, which is his idea of the social process, and, and I made a model of it uh, which I have found to be uh, very useful. And I've often used it as a precursor uh, to moving on to do something using soft systems met methodology. And so this, this, is, this is what he meant by, uh, by that concept of his, of the appreciative uh, setting. In the real world, he says, top of the screen, uh, there is a flux of everyday life in which lots of happenings take place and lots of people have ideas about hap happenings. So here is a two-stranded rope, happenings and ideas unfolding through time, each continually affecting the other. That, that is Vickers' core concept. And what we do is try to appreciate chunks of that two-stranded rope, as he, as he calls it. And that can lead to a, a decision to act, hopefully an act to make things better, and taking that action then feeds one of those two strands of, of, of the rope. Now, 
the appreciation we're now filling in the box in, 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 the, in the middle um, the, the appreciation says and it's rather small print in this in this in this computer uh, we perceive selectively parts of the two standard rope we then make judgments and to make a judgment you have to have a standard and, and so the, these are the standards by which you will make judgments and they may be changed by doing that so they come out at the other side but they may then be different and uh, There, there, there's the content of, of, the, uh, of the appreciation. All right. Okay. Selective perception followed by judgments, and judgments are of three different kinds. What is the case here is the reality judgment. Uh, what is its value? Is it good or bad? Is it acceptable or unacceptable? is the value judgment and do those two judgments lead to instrumental action which could lead to taking action uh, hope to act and hopefully uh, to, to, Im to improve that's the uh, that's the, the notion of uh, the appreciative settings which uh, govern the decision to act and the action which is taken so these are the five bodies of work which I have uh, dis discussed uh, fairly, fairly quickly. Uh, the representation of his holism in the top line, the reductionism of completely separate techniques in, in the bottom line. And uh, here we are back at, uh, at, Vic at Vicar's work. And uh, I, have, I have found... Uh, <laughs> I have <laughs> I have found this uh, this this use of of the two stranded rope ex extremely uh, ex extremely helpful. He, having having gone down to the bottom level, uh, which could have been labelled the slough of despond, we've been coming back up out of out of it uh, in, into. Uh, so uh, so here here is the. Uh, if this is the slough of despond, here the PSMs and the Vickers work are the way to get out of it. Uh, we're on the way back up again here. And uh, <clears throat> I can say, uh, looking at these five bodies of work, that. Uh, I think they make a, a completion of the thinking which I have been doing at Lancaster in developing soft systems methodology. And I, I see uh, this model now as an adjunct to SSM, to uh, what is in soft systems methodology. Uh, And that's the end of the uh, of, of the slides. Uh, the conclusion that, that I take from this is is that I would want OR to become more holistic than it has been in the more recent past. I would want that uh, holism to be embraced. Uh, more more thoroughly than it has been, and to eschew the num the separate techniques all isolated uh, from from each other. Uh, Jeffrey Vickers. Uh, Winning of his uh, Victoria Cross is, is worth uh, recording, I think. Uh, it, 
it, it shows it showed it shows the man. Uh, <coughs> After I had left ICI, I was asked to somebody there knew of Vicar's work and asked me <coughs> if I would uh, arrange with Jeffrey Vickers to go to the ICI headquarters and uh, give them a talk on management. And they collected 100 managers together in one of their arenas and Jeffrey agreed to do it. And I went along to uh, the, the talk, of course, uh, to support Jeffrey. And uh, he started his talk to these 100 ICI managers by saying, uh, I've been asked to talk about management and I would like to start by giving you an example of bad management. And he explained that he had been at his house in Goring-on-Thames that morning and his senior boss had told him collect the company car at such and such a time, drive on such and such a route to Goring-on-Thames where you will find a man, pick him up and then bring him back by such and such a route to the headquarters at ICI. And that was Vickers' idea of a bit of bad management on that part because as he pointed out, this driver was a professional and in giving him his instructions in that way, he had eliminated the man's professionalism. And, and so that was his example of, uh, of bad management in, in that talk. Uh, he was one of the great and the good in British life and he was on many, many committees, uh, uh, many looking after mental health and uh, he, he was uh, part of the London Passenger Transport Board and he was a member of the National Coal Board when, they, when we had a mining industry in this country and uh, he was on the board of the, the, the miners. And uh, the leader of the miners, and of course many, many people here will remember a, a strike which lasted a year of the of the miners, but uh, Arthur Horner. That's what I, that's the thought I'd lost. Arthur Horner was the leader of the miners during this long miners' strike uh, for a year. He was a communist, and Geoffrey Vickers told me that he said to Arthur Horner one day, "When you address the board, the National Coal Board, you always look straight at me. Why do you do that?" And Arthur Horner replied, that's because you're the only member of the board who takes any notice of anything which I say to them. And that, that, that is a, a very, uh, that's, that's a, a very meaningful uh, part of the kind of man that, uh, that, that Vickers was. Uh, He was a great loss, uh, great loss to me, and I, I still hope to uh, complete the final book that I am writing, which will, uh, I hope, pay sufficient tribute to uh, Jeffrey's work. Yes. So this this is this is this is the overall conclusion which I have stumbled my way to. Uh, that I would like to see how our more holistically treated than it currently is and to see the uses not of just an individual technique selected from the parcel of techniques but to use appropriate uh, PSMs and the OR techniques uh, within that more holistic uh, which is provided by the uh, the work from uh, Vickers' notion of the appreciative uh, system. And I'm ready to finish. Thank you. Thank you.